Uh, we focus on helping people find careers in nerd-related industries, like gaming. Um, so what we have today is making music for games, uh, which all of these fine people to my right do. So I would like each of them to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about what you do. Patrick, you want to start? <laughs> uh, my name is Patrick Grisleys. Um I do uh, music and sound effects for games uh, under the name Fat Bard with uh, a buddy of mine, Zach. Um, so it's the two of us. Um, I'm from St. Louis, I grew up here. We've been doing it for about two years now. But I've been doing uh, a lot of different musical endeavors my whole life. So I, I record local bands, and teach lessons, and play gigs with my wife. And, and now I do this. Uh, my name is Sarah Hoff. I'm kind of new to the industry, I guess. Um, I started out as a I'm mostly a music teacher and performer. Um, I have a lot of experience with um, writing orchestral pieces and, and things like that. And I, I really respect um, the, the potential that games have as an artistic uh, medium, and, and I'd, I'd like to see more of them in that area. Uh, my name is Phil Hayes. Um, I've been in music for probably 10, 12 years. Been uh, doing work with uh, the Happy Badgers on a few other games. Um, I also have uh, a number of jobs in the country for me, and I do uh, some commercial scoring sometimes. Um, yeah, I just, you know, do music stuff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Jay Gibbons, and um, uh, a Quincy Studio is my um, studio. And I've composed music uh, for all of my games, uh, but didn't start there. Uh, I, I've never actually pursued music as a career, so I can't give any music career advice with that. But um, I've been composing for a very long time. Um, I have about going on 19 full CDs, if you were just to put all my, CD, my tracks on CDs. Um, so it's a very big passion of mine. And I'm Phil Stortz. I'm sorry for holding this up. I was in another panel speaking. <laughs> uh, I am a beginning composer, but I've written music for all the games I've made, Super Push Adventure, and currently Chickadee and Legends of Adrigal. I also do not pay, play any instrument whatsoever. <laughs> I like that. Well, how did each of you get into music and making music for games? I mean, was it something that you started you know, as a child, like playing different instruments, I think it's probably gonna be pretty different for all of you, especially since Phil, you said you don't play. Not so, anymore. Not anymore. But yeah, how did each of you get started? Um, down yeah, down you want to just run down the line. Um, I've been playing music my whole life, and, and I, I used to do a lot of uh, singer-songwriter kind of stuff. Um, I had dabbled in like film scoring stuff in college, um, and uh, I think. Uh, more recently, you know, I have a, a wife and now a kid who's three three years old, and um, I felt like I wanted a creative outlet that would work for them. Um, and playing gigs at night is not always ideal if you're a, a, a father. Um, but anyway, so uh, I kind of wanted just like a, a creative outlet, basically, that I could do in my own time. I just wake up in the morning and have some coffee and write music for games. And I grew up, you know, playing games my whole life and uh, still play some games. Um, so uh, I'm a bit of a gamer too, and familiar with game music and stuff like that. So it was kind of just more or less like a new creative outlet for me. That could also, you know, I could make some money. So it's kind of the, I guess, the motivation. Mm -hmm. I um, I grew up playing music in orchestras, and I grew up in, in choirs, and I was just really interested in. Um, honestly, I just I studied movie scores because I thought they were cool. I don't know, um, but. Uh, <laughs> Video game scores, in particular, um, I, I found really interesting because, uh, I mean, you can communicate so much more because you're not just, it's not like watching a film, you know, it's its something that you're interacting with and it's something that you're experiencing yourself. Um, and I, I don't know, like, I grew up being like, oh, I want to play all this interesting music that I'm hearing and all these all these games and these and these movies, but it's like, no, 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 I'm going to make this instead. No, I'm not going to play it, I'm going to make it. So that's, that's kind of it. Um, I grew up playing music. Um, started on uh, orchestras, played violin, viola. Uh, then I moved to bass because my hands were really big. Um, after that, I uh, got into high school composition and then moved to, to here in Webster and studied music here, did music theory composition. And 
And um, yeah, it's, I find that when I play certain games that after I'm done playing the game that I'm still playing it in my head. I'm like humming themes and tunes and stuff like that. It's just like the thing that just keep, keeps me coming back. And so I just really kind of got enamored with it and kept going with it. And eventually I got involved with my people at Cat Adventures. And uh, yeah, actually got to write music for games and it was a lot of fun and just kept going with it. Um, I grew up near Nashville, in Music City, uh, and it's very true uh, that <laughs> I grew up around a lot of musicians. My dad was a musician, so music has just always been a part of my life. Um, and uh, when I was a teenager, the first thing I saved up a lot of money for was a uh, really fancy synthesizer. It was like a thousand dollars, and they're so much cheaper now. Um, and that's when I started uh, composing. Um, just, you know, had my synthesizer plucked around on the keys and started making music. And then um, when I was in college, well, I went to college for screenwriting, I took some um, music classes also because I just wanted to get some solid knowledge uh, about what I was doing as a passion for so long. Um, and then um, this is gonna, creep over into another thing I will probably talk about, uh, but games, Nobuyamatsu is just my idol. Mm -hmm. uh, even like game music, from the moment I started composing, I was like trying to make music like his. I was making like little, oh well, here's a little town song, here's a character song. Um, uh, so I was actually composing music with games in mind, sort of from the beginning. I started my musical career in elementary school. I did a little choir. And then in junior high, I played the clarinet. And then I didn't play another instrument until college, which was the piano for a little while. But it was so hard to take it from lesson to lesson that I quit. I'm surprised no one laughed at that joke. Uh, it must be late in the afternoon. Uh, now, uh, I started also at college doing music composition because that was something that really intrigued me because my dad had this easy to use software for composing music and I just spent like eight hours of a day spent on it because it was so awesome to do and yeah. <laughs> Well, that kind of, Jenny, something you said kind of leads into our next question, which is the, like, particular, like you said, you've always been composing and with games in mind. Like, that's something that you grew up doing. Was there something that kind of was the impetus for each of you to, to start thinking, like, I'm not just going to make music for, you know, myself or for bands or what have you, but for games specifically, was there a particular game that you started with that, that like, changed your mind and said, okay, this is the way I'm going to try to live now? And we start in the end with, you down there fill this time. Okay. Uh, a game that, well, it's a game that started my fascination with game music, and that was Final Fantasy VI, which was known as Final Fantasy III in the U.S. Uh, Nobu Matsu, of course, I idolize him as well, and uh, that's when my interest in music really started to take shape. Did I answer the question right? <laughs> I, don't even remember, I don't even remember the question is what I'm saying. Basically, yes. I think, yes! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Was there, you know, let's go to the other fault. Was there another game that, that inspired you or like motivated you to start wanting to compose for games? Um, yeah, I'm also a new Louis Matsu fan. I, I can't help it. it. The stuff's just great. Um, I'm trying to think of other games, like a lot of old Sonic games back in the day, and like the, the simple known as Mario, and they just stick with you, and it's just like, I like how this works. I want to see how I can get that to work. Mm -hmm. Sarah, I know you said that like you were a big film fan, like to me, like mm -hmm. movie music was your inspiration. Yeah. So does that, was that something that you thought, like, I want to start creating this kind of like landscape for games as well. Yeah, um, well, I mean, again, I, I kind of came from the orchestral standpoint. Um, when, when you're in an orchestra, you're taught to think of each individual piece of music as a story arc all on its own. And, and you start to think about like the ups and the downs and the momentum that works around that. And then from there, you think about 
how the viewers are actually experiencing it and, and what they're feeling. And like going from games as, as a, an artistic medium and all, all the different levels we can communicate in there, like think, uh, keeping in mind what you want the players to feel. And then, and then it, it kind of becomes like painting a picture in that sense. It's like you, you have the specific feelings that you want in the game or in the environment. And I mean, I, I don't, is that, I don't, is that the question? I don't know. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think actually that leads into a kind of a transition. What are some of the challenges that you guys each face when you're creating these soundscapes for games? Because I'm obviously, like for film, you have something to go by that's very, you know, it's two hours long if it's a film, something around that. Um, with a game, it it can go for much longer. It can be shorter. It has mm -hmm. to represent a lot of different characters and landscapes. So what are some of the challenges each of you face? Patrick? Um, well, a simple challenge is making a looping song. So you know, that's probably some of the first hurdles that you have to overcome when you start writing music for games. Is a lot of times you want to make something that um, has a clear ending, and it doesn't. Um, especially if you're, this is kind of a technical thing, but if, if you're working with ambient music, it's especially hard to make it loop in a way that uh, it's seamless, put it that way. When you have long decays on on instruments and things echo out for a long time, making that loop in a way that you're not going to notice is difficult. Uh, other challenges would be like um, it's really a, a lot of it is, is uh, uh, working with clients. You know what I mean? So um, that's always a, a bit of a challenge. It's it's like everyone has their own vocabulary for music, right? For describing what music is and thing like. So if I say that is too hot, what does that mean to some of you? You know. Too hot to me means it's too loud, you know, or uh, you know what I mean. So everyone has different 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 ways of describing music, and so you kind of have to learn your client's language, and you also have to learn how much give and take there's going to be, right? Because not every single client is going to be. I want to say I should stop client, but like game developers, like not every game developer is going to be um, uh, just kind of let you have free reign, you know what I mean? Like. Uh, and, and you have to learn how to take criticism, right? So that's one thing that any creative person can have a hard time dealing with because we all, we all have, you have to have an ego to be, to be a creative person. You have to, because it's the only way you can create, right? Uh, you have to have confidence in yourself. Like how can you make something unconfident, you know what I mean? So like your ego comes out when you create something, but it shouldn't be there outside of that, you know? Like if I go play a gig somewhere, like my ego comes out while I'm playing because it, it gives me the confidence to play in front of a bunch of people. But if if I let that come out when I'm just talking to someone and say, you know what, I, I really don't like that uh, that wind instrument in the song. You're, and you're like, don't you understand? Like that that's like the core piece of it. Like that represents the wind that's in this level. Like that's my interpretation. You're crushing me. You're crushing my soul right now. You, know, like, you have to learn how to like, you know, over, overcome that. You have to take criticism from people to, constructively. Know, and, and, and and you have to know it's 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 a lot of it for me is just working with people. It's just that, you know it's yeah. just, I have to you have to you have to understand people. You know yeah, I, mean? I, I think that as a challenge that translates through any kind of piece of game development, like working oh, yeah. as a team. So no, that makes a lot of sense. So um, yeah, I mean it's it's kind of along the same lines. Um, the thing that I've I've come across is the difference in vision for the actual project. Um, like. What, what Patrick was saying about difference in vocabulary, um, you could say one thing and it'll mean something completely different to someone else. And it's like, okay, well, I wanna represent this particular, particular element in this scene in this way. And then, you know, someone that you're working with might be like, well, that doesn't really make sense to me. And it's, it's just, I mean, you gotta kind of find something that means the same thing for both of you, but it might not be what you originally wanted and it might not be what they originally wanted. So it's awkward in that sense. <laughs> like, um, yeah. And, um, and it's, those subtracts are going to repeat during different situations um, quite a bit. So I went from, and it depends on the game you're working on, but for me, I went from creating specific songs um, for like a scene in my head or a character to breaking each song into like a mood um, this is this song is kind of gonna represent um, 
it's going to be played when the characters are investigating something and they're feeling um, a little wary, but um, it's not so ominous that there's immediate danger. You know, I kind of break, break the songs into moods of, um, and, and think about where I'm going to place them based on that. Uh, but it's hard for me because I like, um, I really like to do like character pieces and stuff, which I can still do, but I just, you have to be careful. Yeah, that makes sense to kind of be thinking of it from a technical standpoint, not just kind of an emotional one with music, because that can be really a lot of overlap, I'd imagine. Yeah, mm -hmm. your music has to work in a lot of different situations. Since I'm much more inexperienced as everyone else here, my answer will be a bit shorter. Uh, when I'm currently composing music for an RPG, so as you can probably guess, that has a lot of music to factor in. So when I'm starting to compose a theme, I'll get along with it and then I'll say, okay, well, I don't want it for this moment, I want it for this <clears throat> moment. So about five compositions later, I finally get the song I want and it's like, well, I don't need this anymore because I've got these other songs now. So it's a lot of, uh, just because I'm so inexperienced with music somewhat, uh, it's, it's, it can be difficult deciding on what theme works for what situation best. Have you guys faced any challenges with like tools themselves or just something more on the technical side like Jenny was talking about other than that? A simple thing that you come across is, is file format. So uh, one issue that you're going to have is that uh, uh, probably the biggest issue is that MP3s don't loop seamlessly. So uh, that is a problem because if you're developing for mobile, Apple and uh, Android are, kind of have a different list of audio formats that are compatible with each of them. And so the best one is always going to be OGD. That's like the, it's like the one that should be the future. And it's open source, but the problem is, is they don't, I don't know, for whatever reason, Apple doesn't want to use it. And if it did, then it would solve every problem you would ever have. The problem is, is they won't, they won't accept it. And so, because they have AAC, which is kind of their thing. But anyways, but MP, MP3 is the common one between both of them. So if you use a program like Unity or something, that's going to be what they're going to want you to use. The problem is, is that you make an MP3, it encodes and decodes, right? And so there's always this like silence gap at the beginning. You cannot do anything about it. There's articles on it how you could probably get rid of it, but it's still theoretical, and I still haven't seen someone actually do it themselves. Now, Unity does have the ability to, to encode, to, to put it in the game in a way where it will make it loop pretty seamlessly. But the, yeah. the results are gonna be different on different devices, yeah. and so, it's really inconsistent. yes, and so that's a challenge. Uh, so that's that's probably one of the, the most common technical things you come across, is like you make a piece of music and it loops perfectly in your program, and then you put it in, you get a build, and you're like, nope, 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 it doesn't loop, there's a little skip there, you know, and, and then it leads you to think, well, maybe I'll just fade out every track or something, so it ends, in a in a kind of gentle way and then starts back up, you know. That works well for ambient stuff. You know, a good example of that would be like uh, Terraria. Oh, so you play Terraria, the little daytime music, kind of like creeps in. It's like, you know, and then it creeps out. It's actually a very short, it's like a minute and 40 seconds or something, but uh, uh, that's kind of situational, though. It's a little different because it's a situational game. There's kind of like an ambient thing underneath that that then loops around and that kind of comes up and down, but yeah, there's a lot of different ways you can basically try to solve it, but it's it's kind of a hard problem right now. And it'll get better whenever they figure out what they're doing, or you can just use wave files, which are like the super high quality audio files, but they take up an immense amount of space. Yeah, and two songs take up like basically a full mobile game, so it doesn't really <laughs> work. So until it, one, it's going to give one way or the other. But I'm hoping that Apple will just you know finally accept their GD, but we'll see. <laughs> Not right now. The Unity uh, will take waves and then basically convert them into whatever format it is when it like binarizes the package. Mm. That helps a lot. It's like, oh yeah, okay, yeah, totally. <laughs> well, there's sort of like contract construct, which is kind of like a really simple program, but it's it's nice because it actually dual encodes, mm -hmm. so it has uh, OGG and then AAC, and depending on the platform you, you decide to publish for it, it'll, it'll automatically convert it. So it's like your high quality things are always one file type and there's always wave and then it just stays that way until you actually split it off.
I don't know if that's too complicated. Mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's, it's an annoyance. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been talking about challenges. What are some of the, like I know that there's various levels of experience and kind of how you've each done it and come at it, but how have, what are some of the games that you guys have worked on that have been the best projects and maybe a reason why they were for you? Anyway. Well, no Super worries. Push Adventure because it's my only game. <laughs> uh, I, I thought mean, so. Uh, my, uh, my game Quantum Conscience um, was one that I both just really love composing for and also, uh, like, the first thing people say to me about my games, they like the music. And, um, I think it's because it was a sci-fi story, and I really love to do synth, uh, you know, slightly techno, but just synth, well, use a lot of synth sounds, and um, it was right up my alley, and um, what was really fun for me was that I, I, it was a story I had conceived a long time ago, and I had already composed some music for it uh, when I was, you know, very early along. Um, in my composing process. And so I went back and took that old music and reimagined it, and that was a whole lot of fun to do. Um, and I think just the fact that the, the story environment really fit the kind of sounds I like to use and the, the moods I like to make. Simple thing for me is like sometimes just when I can I'm a guitar player primarily, although I took piano lessons for a long time growing up, played violin growing up. Like guitar is like my main thing, and so it's anytime I can play guitar, I'm mostly really happy. It's kind of a selfish thing. It's not really like, oh, the game came together well and it unifies the music. It's like, nah, I just I, I, I enjoyed it because I can play it better. <laughs> <laughs> like I just did a John Deere thing, and it was like I got to play like country bumpkin kind of guitar <laughs> stuff, and I was like, yes. <laughs> but most of the time I'm doing like keyboard stuff. Working with samples and stuff, so when you get to actually play a real instrument, it's always like nice. I'm not saying keyboard is not a real instrument, I'm just saying it's like it's just different. I don't know, it's not quite as visceral. As Are there any games that each of you like look at and say that's the kind of music I want to make or what I wish I could be doing right now or aspiring to? Uh, has anybody played the unfinished song? Mm -hmm. The music in my game is fantastic, fantastic. And it's like, it's so playful and it seems like a childish kind of um, theme that's going on there. And then it also has kind of water things that are in there, which kind of fits with, you know, from pink everywhere and water on everything. Um, and then uh, there's that and then Journey, it's fantastic. Um, the, the music in that game, the, the composers really worked with um, storytelling for music because that game didn't have any dialogue, no way to communicate with people that you're playing with. It's just moving you through the story and, and helping you like feel what what um, the developers were thinking just through the music. And it's just like, oh, how do you do this? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, I was also going to say Jeremy. And, and it's amazing how the music changes just so seamlessly with your experience. And I'm not sure how they technically accomplished it. That's definitely something like to achieve someday, but it's just so beautiful. Well, I want to make sure we have some time for questions, but do you guys each have, you know, some specific advice you'd offer to people looking to start making music for games? I would advise you to come to my talk tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> specifically That's talks about that. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> I would say something Something that one of my professors in college told me that, um, you know, you don't always get along with your college professors, but you respect them for all of the stuff that they have in their brains. Um, something he said to me is that if you ever want to write good music, you have to study great musicians and great composers, and you have to know what you respect about them and why. And, and you have to just really get into their mindset and, and um, what they were trying to accomplish and what they were essentially trying to communicate. Work to work to master the fundamentals. Um, whenever you're learning any particular craft, um, figure out what those fundamentals are. Practice them. After you master them, apply them in different ways, and then 
continue to practice fundamentals. Like it's it it gets you out of so many different situations that uh, it's great. Yeah. I'm just gonna say know that you can get started really cheaply, which is very very nice. Um, uh, these days you don't have to buy a thousand dollar synthesizer. You can get like a forty dollar little keyboard and hook it up to your computer, and you can download sounds and get started. Um, so. Uh, you know, you start playing around, see see what you can do, and uh, go from there. I would say listen to a lot of music, especially the kinds that you really like, and say to yourself, well, why do I like it? What what parts are really good to me? And how can I sort of try to implement that into my own music? I want to open it up. Does anyone have some questions for this one? Right back. So I come from predominantly like an orchestral composing background, and so I use a lot of dynamics in my music. Um, that's normally not a problem, but for video games, if I have like a really quiet part of the song, then you know whoever's playing the game can turn it up, and then it gets loud later on, and all of a sudden it's like blasting their blasting their eardrums out because it got way too loud. So, from your guys' perspective, is that something that you would worry about as the composer, or is that something that you let the game developers deal with later? limit the volume or something like that through their programming. I, I come from a recording background, so I would I would say you, you have to deal with it on yourself, basically. Um, dynamic music is, it's good to have it, right? But you, you have to use um, like compression and limiting, like on your, I'm gonna say master fader or whatever, like on the entire track, to make it so that it stays a relatively even volume. Because it's more background music, it really has to be even in volume or else it really will, like you're saying, just disappear when it gets quiet. There's a way to make it, if you compress and limit it, basically what you're doing is you're making it so the volume stays the same, but the intensity changes. You know what I mean? So the listener will still perceive that it got more intense. It just didn't like rise up greatly in volume. You know what I mean? Like think of when you listen to something on the radio, right? So you ever heard the radio? They have these massive, they like severely limit the stuff on the radio. It kind of helps transmit it essentially, but like, uh, you ever heard a verse and then there's a big chorus coming, you know it's coming. And it's like, do, 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 here it comes and it's right. like yeah. the chorus comes and it actually comes down to volume. Have you ever heard that? Mm -hmm. That's like limiting and compression. It's so like you're doing that, but not to that extent. Like that's, mm -hmm. that's bad. Don't do that. But like, get it near there. Have you ever studied the harpsichord or like learn anything about it? Like in terms of how it works fundamentally? No. Um, so the harpsichord basically is like a, the piano, but instead of like hammers hitting the strings, there's like a pluck, and you can't control the volume of it at all. So like what a lot of composers will end up doing is they'll play sparser uh, arrangements of notes, and then once they want to increase the intensity, they play more notes. So it's like a, it's kind of controlling the dynamics through uh, basically the, uh, the volume of uh, music that you're playing. Other questions? Okay. Uh, can you guys describe your working relationship with the game? Developers, the people that, you, that are actively creating the game. Like, what's your process as far as sharing the pieces? At what point are you giving them, uh, you know, a finished piece of work or maybe part of work, get feedback on it? You know, what, what's that dynamic like working with those, like those partners? Um, if you're not making it for yourself. I can't even see you guys. Right? <laughs> um, generally, whenever uh, the festivities begin, um, we'll get together, discuss what the game's about, uh, if we have any concepts, 10 tracks, anything like that. Um, and then I will, as I said before, I'll make like a list of like, we'll just make like a list of words or uh, things that describe like emotions and like what kind of feelings we're going for, or what's, what's our game's like color style and the level of uh, um, quality that's going into how it's going to look and things like that. And then um, after that, I just kind of sit, think, and then put together something as quickly as I can. Um, I probably put together maybe like short eight bar loops, 16 bar loops, 32 bar loops, and then get those to them as quickly as I can so that they can say, uh, no, yes, no. <laughs> like, okay, so cut that, cut that, take this, expand it. 
and then we just keep going through that process and then after that it's just arranging the layers of how things work together um, and yes yeah, as, as, as as hopefully I can get you know feedback as quickly as possible because it's a lot of tweaking it's a lot of tweaking it's a lot of removing parts and parts and like changing when things appear and stuff like that it's like okay it's, uh, just you know emails uh, sometimes we meet in person when we meet in person, it's great because then I feel like a DJ. We're just like, all right, so here's this part. <laughs> oh, that part's great. Yeah, all right, yeah. Right in there. And, and you just, you know, do stuff like that. <laughs> so, me personally, I don't have any kind of musical background. I didn't grow up playing any instruments. Um, Self taught on a couple instruments starting in my teens, but I just play by ear. I don't read music, I don't have any composition experience. So, uh, what, what kind of resources could you guys recommend, either locally or online, to start? Building those skills. Were you asking about like Lessons? to learn about music or to learn about the actual like the recording and, and you know saying like the some of both. Some of both. Uh, yeah, that's. A good there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of resources online for music. Um, you can just search for film scoring cliches. You can find some good lists of just like. Things that you maybe never realize, but are, are kind of obvious once you once you see them, you know, or, or, you know what I mean. Just things like that. So like that, that helps you with like instrumentation and stuff like that. Because sometimes instrumentation is like half the battle. You know what I mean? Like picking the right instrument. Yeah. So like uh, that's helpful uh, for music stuff. I mean, there's just there's so much on the internet, but learning about scales and theory and modes are really useful for film scoring. A lot of people just understand major and minor harmony and they say, okay, everything's in the major key, it's happy, or in the minor key, it's sad, but there's so much more than that. The modes are very useful, like understanding Dorian and Bridian, Lydian and Mixolydian, and Wail and minor, and then Locrian. Uh, and then like oddball scales like are very useful too, that people use a lot. And people even make up their own scale, they call it tetrachord, to take a set of notes and then another set of notes essentially put them together to create a scale, you know? But like, you know, sounds like like a gypsy scale, for example, like immediately you would associate it with like a Egyptian -ish, ish thing. It's like desert level. Okay, we're gonna go. We're gonna go with the gypsy scale. You know what I mean? Like knowing that stuff is very helpful because then when a client says, "We okay, there's a desert level," in your head you're gonna be like, "Okay, like, let's I see. Know, I know. World instruments: sitar, uh, tabla, uh, you know, <laughs> shaker or something. Uh, you know, for the sand or something. You know, and, and, and then yeah. you and you think of scales. And you're like, okay, well, Phrygian is kind of like kind of works for that. It's got a flamenco -y sound and then the gypsy scale, you know? But yeah, there's a lot of resources online. You know, if you're PC, you get Reaper. It's free. Uh, unless you make enough money and you have to pay for it. If you're Mac, you have GarageBand. You know, if you upgrade to Logic Pro, it's like 200 bucks and it's, you know, there are lots of people that use it. You know, lots of, you know, there's lots of pros that use it. So you can't go wrong with that. You know? I also like to look into things like animals, like how things relate to where you currently are and where you would like to go next um, chords, which is basically just building up on top of variables themselves. Mm -hmm. Usually how that affects me emotionally is like, oh, that feels great. This doesn't feel so great. Let's go back and then you know, just do things like that. Um, Vocalizing is good music. Like if you, uh, uh, if you can sing what you want to, to hear, learning how to play that, you know what I'm saying? So like if you have a keyboard and you want to go make a certain melody, like just sing it, and then figure out where those notes are, play it out. You'd be like, oh, well, there it is, right? Because sometimes you can come up with a better melody with your voice than you can with your instrument. It's a common practice when you learn how to solo and improvise, like if you get into jazz or blues or whatever, mm -hmm. it's heavy improvisation, like you, you vocalize. Have like you ever heard the guy George Benson, his guitar player, and he goes, like, well, he's soloing, he literally sings a solo, like, through a microphone. But most jazzers, you'll hear them do that. They'll be like, like while they're soloing, like even if it's like weird grunts and groans, I had a teacher once that just wailed. He wailed the direction that he moved. So if he's going up, he go. <laughs> Imagine being in a small like box room taking a private lesson from someone that's doing that like two inches from your face, and you didn't know they were going to do it until they did. It. You know, first time laughing, and they hold yourself. Yeah, that was pretty funny. Was that not supposed to be funny? Yeah, <laughs> but that's very helpful. Vocalizing is like. Music. It's awkward to sing, but it's good. Shower sound for that. What's it that? Like, yeah, shower sound.
as a mus <coughs> as a musician who doesn't have any developing experience, what would be the best way for me to connect with developers? <laughs> Games like these. Game jams. There's also the new co-op um, that we just formed, um, yeah. and they have meetings uh, at least once a month. Um, so the co-op is on the back of your pamphlet here. Um, St. Louis Game Developers Cooperative. Um, that is not just for developers. That is also for musicians and artists. Um, come to these events. Uh, check out the website. Um, join the website, um, and developers are there, artists are there, um, and it's a great place to meet people. A lot of these people uh, come to these events, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Is that? Fan pal. And other online communities as well, that you can kind of meet up with people that maybe aren't local to you. Do you recommend? I'm not sure. Yeah, there's a lot of online game jams. Yeah. That's a good one. Uh, but it's kind of hard to find a team on that. Yeah. Uh, TIG forums are really good. Ooh, yeah. TIG forums, if you ever heard of that. There's, there's even like people will post, you know, say, I need a musician. You know, it's a good place to go. A little secret I do is I look at the dev logs there. So developers, they make their own little blog there to kind of hold themselves accountable and also just let people see like the progress they're making. So you can look at a game and be like, this looks like a game that I could do something with them. You just you literally just spam email them, and you're just like, hey, can I can I work? With you? I've got I've gotten a couple jobs through doing that. Like good job. So it's you never know. And a lot, there's a lot of like serious indie games that, that, that do the devlog on there. You'd be surprised at what's what's actually on there. So. Yeah, some really big stuff coming out. Before all of the game jams too on Twitter. Uh, people are usually looking for people and you can usually either search the hashtag so uh, yeah, Ludum there Ludum there is a big one um, and this is thousands of people are making games so you, you're gonna find someone if you're really looking to connect with someone just literally almost anyone um, if you just look at the hashtag Ludum there before there before it's running or even during it's running some people are looking for um, composers artists whatever um, and so just going to Ludum There's a website, finding out when that next event is, and just kind of start following the hashtag and tweeting, hey, I'm a musician looking to do some stuff for people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good advice. I think there was one more question in the back. Yeah. You mentioned yeah. like musical cliches. I was just wondering if you ever try to break away from those when you're working on them. Sometimes it's it's inescapable. <laughs> Sometimes you have to. Uh, yeah, I mean, of course you try to escape it. You try to get clever. You try to use because that's that really refers to instrumentation typically. It's like specifically say, okay, this instrument make is good for this this uh, style. But sometimes it's also melodic or like melody and stuff like that that can be cliche. But uh, yeah, I don't know. You try to get out of it when you can. Yeah, I mean, sometimes you run into situations where it's like. Why? What is this? And it's just like, I'm just gonna, just gonna break away from it. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do it. <laughs> yeah. There's what? a time. Go ahead. Time to do it and a time to not. Just yeah, confidence. Because I think sometimes I will try so hard. I, you know, I'll have this melody in my head, and I'll just be like, that's so predictable. It's just so, you know, first, fourth, fifth chords. It's just, you know, so predictable. So I'll spend all this time like trying to, um, you know, mix it up, make it, you know, break from the cliche, and in the end, the melody that I started with was just fine and, and um, worked for what I wanted to do. So there's a time when you can just embrace what what you're feeling in your head, and when you need to break out and experiment. Anybody, anybody else? Is there anything else for you? Um, I mean, along those same lines, if, if you're having trouble with like um, a very generic chord progression, what you can do is add extra tones to add color, and then also change up the time signatures sometimes, or make one one measure just, I mean, just one measure that's an extra beat, or one fewer beats, that it just kind of catches you off guard a little bit and kind of re-interests <coughs> the listeners. Um, and then, uh, I was say something else, I don't remember. <laughs> In this day and age of technology, do you guys find yourself working with many actual musicians, or do you leave it up to samples for the most part? 
Samples, samples for convenience. Samples. Mm -hmm. You can't you can't afford yeah. the stage right. to pay for people, you know, unless you're working with someone with a lot of money and with a lot of uh, trust in you. Because sure. look at it this way: what if I make a what if I make a track and the developer says this is great, but it's too fast? And I was at the studio with these musicians. We recorded this. Like, yes, you can stretch music, you can time stretch music nowadays with technology, but it does not sound good. Sure. You ever use YouTube and slowed it down to half speed? Mm. <laughs> it's all this artifacts and distortion, so you can't do that, you know? It's like, well, I just spent all this money and now it's not gonna work. But with samples, it's all MIDI, I can just change tempo, bam, and everything sounds the exact, the quality is exactly the same. So it's it's a necessary evil, and you gotta work fast and efficient, you know? Now a follow up question to that would be what are your some of your sources, your favorite sources to go for samples? Uh, or do you like to create your own? No one's got time to create your own. I tend to frequent East West Choir Malik. Yes. Um, they've just recently started doing like a subscription service, which is kind of nice, um, though they don't give you like all the mic positions. I know that you know with music there's so much licensing issue like you know with these samples are you like yeah. you're talking about a subscription fee as well that you're paying like like you would if you were trying to get you know getty images or something like that you're paying for the samples or are there a lot of free resources uh, free resources you don't have to pay a license to use the sample. like once you pay for the samples they're yours and you can put them in your data. Okay. you do run into problems though so sound fonts are a really cheap and free way to get a lot of samples you know, it's a sampling format if you get sound font uh, uh, player or whatever, like in your in your program, mm -hmm. it's a uh, it's really nice, and you can even download. So every people have sound put all these old video games into sound font. So let's say you want the sound from Chrono Trigger, just literally type in Google Chrono Trigger sound font. You can download. It's just a quick little download. Okay. It's super small. And now if you load that up, you can just literally choose from all the sounds that were used in the game. This is no joke. Any Nintendo games, like almost any NES, SNES. The problem is that so there's a legal gray area. It's like, can I actually use this in a commercial product? That's where you run trouble. But if I bought, like, let's say, uh, a sampler, you know, sampling for contact, like, that's the license is always just like uh, royalty free or whatever. Like, you can okay. just use it for whatever you want. If you're gonna buy, I say, if you have a thousand dollars, you buy complete by native instruments. It's like the best yeah. thing you can buy for a thousand dollars. Trust me, that's a lot of money to spend, it's, yeah, it's but it's it's, it's but it's it'll you like you will. If, if you have a problem like making something, it's your own fault. Like you, like you know what I'm saying. Sure. If you can't make it sound good with that, like you gotta go back. You know, go back to the fundamentals. Yeah. You know what I mean? What was it called? Complete, complete. Uh, it's just called with K. Okay. Because they're clever like that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. There's a lot of free ones though. They make a contact free player. Like if you want, you can get contact for. Uh, there's a free version that has a lot of samples on it that are all pretty good. Uh, and then there's also the Adventure Space, a reactor program, which is more kind of synth oriented, and they make a free version of that you can download. Guitar Rig is free. If you plug your guitar in, you can get a free version of that. There's, oh, there's tons of free stuff. Any other questions, guys? I'm guessing, uh, I just, um, in terms of the, the, the MI MIDI uh, programs, what's your favorite go to MIDI program? And, I guess a follow-up question there is, what's an inexpensive one too? <laughs> Reaper is free for PC. Yep. Um, it's more complicated. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know. I guess it depends on what you're looking for. But Reaper is free. I mean, you, can't, yeah. you can't go wrong with free. There's no garage band is the other free yeah. for Mac, but that's yeah, that's it. I mean, I think there's, there's also uh, Renoise, which is a, it's a basically it was a tracker which. Really well, so that's the thing. Like, yeah, there's these tracker programs, and I don't know if that's what you're looking for. Oh, like, what? you got to be pretty hardcore to do the yeah, tracker. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. I was looking for a program where you could plug a keyboard in and kind of type oh, it so out. You don't, you don't want the tracker. Yeah. You don't want yeah. the tracker. Yeah. The tracker is like, so like people shovel them. You just, the guy used the tracker program because they want to be old school and they want to work within the limitations of like that era of gaming. But like, unless you are like super into that, yeah. don't don't do that. <laughs> It'll take you like five years to make yeah. a game. Like, that's what everyone used to use, but it's not. It's just a bunch of numbers like on a screen. Like it doesn't look like 
music. Yeah. Vinny doesn't even look like music, but at least it <laughs> approximates it. Yeah. Yeah. You're basically writing the music in hexadecimal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's pretty intense. Yeah. I have a hard time recommending this because I keep wanting a better program, but uh, I use Ableton Live for whatever reason. <laughs> but it was, you know, convenient to get. You know, I got like the, the light. It's like seventy or eighty dollars with them. Comes with a lot of good sounds, and then you can bring in VSTs, hook up your keyboard. So that's what I do, and that has worked for me. So I think that's a little over our time. So thanks everybody for coming out.